Hello, and welcome to another episode of Fast Forward, a podcast from QSR Magazine, where we talk to the founders, innovators, and entrepreneurs behind some of the world's most exciting fast casual restaurant concepts. My name is Sam Okus. I'm the editor of QSR and the editorial director of Food News Media. Today, I'm sharing a conversation with Jay Kim. He is the founder and CEO of Chilantro Barbecue, a Korean barbecue concept based in Austin, Texas, that started as a food truck and is now eight units strong and going into franchising. Let me take you real quick back to, say, 2008, 2009. The food truck movement was really starting to take off, uh, sort of coincided with the recession. People were trading down, looking for cheap eats, but still wanted some adventurous quality food. And out of that came J. Kim and Chilantro. In 2010, he launched Chilantro as a food truck on the streets of Austin, really trying to reach into his Korean heritage uh, to bring this Korean-Mexican fusion to life. But recognizing that at the time, food trucks were sort of that sexy thing, that, that, that opportunity for him to get in cheap and to be able to capture the attention of Austinites, particularly the late night crowds in downtown Austin, who are you know maybe out for a couple of drinks and, and want to grab a bite while they're out. For a while, while he was like any other food truck success story, he found success with uh, some of these drinkers, the late night crowd. He, uh, you know, was putting in a long day. But what really changed things for him was when he created his signature product, the original kimchi fries. Now, I have had these kimchi fries, and they are an absolute revelation. They are delicious. As Jay will get into in our conversation, uh, this definitely captured the attention of his late night crowd. Uh, but what he found was that people kept coming back more and more for it. And then and at this time, too, you saw the social media revolution happened, and that was just, you know, fuel on the flames for him, that it really started to take off. He built a buzz for himself, and especially when South by Southwest would come to town every March, he was able to use that as a platform to bigger audiences. Another way that Chilantro really jumped onto the map of not only foodies, but also investors everywhere, uh, was Jay appeared on Shark Tank in 2016. He brought the Chilantro concept to the investors on the show at that point he had grown into the brick and mortar space uh, and he was looking for an investment and he did score one uh, from Barbara Corcoran. Uh, we get into a little bit more in our conversation about how that all went down and and what happened after he got that investment. But really what Jay will talk about here is how much that did for just marketing the, the Chilantro brand and how it put it on the map for so many people within but also outside of Austin. Chilantro has now grown to eight units uh, around Austin and Jay is looking to really shift this thing into the next gear. He's going to launch franchising this year, and he wants to take this Korean barbecue, Mexican-Korean fusion concept to the next level. And I'm excited to watch as he goes about doing that. We started by talking about actually the business before Chilantro. Uh, Jay started with a, a, a different concept, and uh, as he talks about here, he learned a lot from the mistakes that he made with this failed concept. But ultimately, uh, as he says here, those mistakes led to success at Chilantro. So my first entry point to owning a business and on my entrepreneurial journey uh, started when I owned a coffee shop. I started a coffee shop when I was 21. I ran it for three years. And I, I won't necessarily say that, you know, I was an entrepreneur. Uh, I would just have to say, like, I was an employee of my own business. I worked <laughs> every day. Uh -huh. uh, I just grind every day. I, it wasn't successful. Uh, it was a time when Starbucks was like opening up a ton of shops yeah. and uh, I found a local coffee and I thought, oh, I'm going to build my store across the street from Starbucks. But the way the Starbucks was building was like on, people are on their way to work and they're just grabbing Starbucks and going. Yeah. Mine was like on the opposite way. They had to take a U-turn to get to uh -huh. my coffee shop. So obviously, you know, I'm just... Attracting people who are just, just camping. Or or coffee for the way home, right? <laughs> Absolutely. But who wants coffee on right. the way home? So uh, I ran it for three years as an employee. That was my first start to the entrepreneur journey mm -hmm. in restaurant industry. Um, I started Chilantro in 2010. And in 2009-ish, uh, towards the end of the year, uh, I was coming out of a business uh, was failing. Mm -hmm. So I had $30,000 in savings. I maxed out my credit card, which is close to around 30,000 in all in all in. And with about $60,000 and I said, I can probably survive for three months, hmm. uh, by leasing a food truck 
and not knowing how to run the food truck or having the experience of uh, serving you know larger uh, crowd uh, I just went out uh, I hired a cook and February 1st of 2010 uh, I went out to Dolby Mall which is a uh, part of University of Texas mm-hmm. uh, and I parked it I parked a truck that was the start of it so wh- what was it about the restaurant industry the food service industry because Obviously, the coffee shop did not deter you from trying food service again. Yeah. Were, do you have, does, you, does your family have a history with the food service industry, or is there something about this industry that you were passionate about? I always, uh, when I was younger, I wanted to be an architect, hmm. or I wanted to design something. And I thought that was, that, that's where my path was going to be. My dad was in a uh, contracting business. Mm. So he was building mid rises uh, out in Korea. He was doing real estate. So I kind of have a, had the natural, um, like eye for it. Mm-hmm. I loved like seeing cool places and I thought, Oh, like what if I can do that? I love to make people happy by providing, you know, just a great environment of place where people are happy. Yeah. Um, unfortunately I just don't think I was, talented in becoming an interior designer or architect but uh i've always had a dream of running a restaurant Hmm. so that's always been my goal never had the money to do it never had the proper experience but food truck was just the perfect outlet for me at that time to start and see where it went Mm -hmm. going back to the coffee shop what were the lessons from that that you ended up taking with you to cilantro uh, that's a great question. Uh, just regrets. Hmm. Um, you know, after I closed, uh, I thought about, oh, what if I could have done that? I should have done this. It really opened my eyes mm-hmm. on, I think that's probably part, partly the reason why I wanted to try it, hmm. right? The, on, the, on my next venture, like I want to improve it. Um, so, when I started Cilantro, even though I didn't know much about how to run the business, I told myself that I would never regret. So I would never tell myself I should, I could, or I would. I would actually put everything into an action and see what happens. Because I'd rather fail and just tell myself, you know what, I tried my best. Mm-hmm. I worked so hard. Uh, and, you know, I was working man, I don't know, 60, 80, 80, 80 hours sometimes. Mm. I was sleeping on the food truck during Brutal. like shifts just to get back on the road and serve crowd till 3 a.m., 4 a.m. Mm-hmm. and w- would come back, clean the truck and do it all over again the next day. Um, so that was my mentality. It was all just putting uh, whatever my heart or mind were, were telling me, I would just put those into an action. Sure. And I yeah. think that kind of changed it for me. That's interesting because this is also at the height of the recession, 2010. I mean, yeah. this is pretty brutal time for businesses. That's right. But I guess, I mean, this is also when food trucks took off because low barrier of entry right. for getting into the industry. What were those factors for you that was like, I got to do a food truck? Yeah, I, I, you're right. So in 2010 in Austin was not like how it was today. Mm-hmm. So uh, I, you know, I quickly realized that this is like February of, of 2010, really cold month for some reason. And our brand really didn't take off till like uh, South by Southwest, which is in March. Yeah. So it took about a month for me to, and there was like such a longest month, I remember, because we were not busy at all. Like my first day sale was $7. Oh. Next day was 14 It's brutal. Yeah. And I remember telling uh, my cook, Julia, which who will come back to because she's still with me, which I'm so proud of. And that's, you know, she's part of our culture. Yeah. Um, but I remember telling her, it's like, I have money saved up. You don't have to worry about not getting paid, you know? Uh, so, you know, that was the experience that I had and it's so blur for me, but it was a struggle. Yeah. Uh, and in March, uh, South by Southwest. So, I started looking for these empty lots to go into. And I think that's when I found, you know, downtown spots. Now they, there's, there are high rises and they're building something on it. But right. we had some empty lots. So I was able to park there and uh, serve lunch, move my food truck and serve dinner. Mm-hmm. And uh, 
uh, it, it was just a great opportunity for me because it was cheap. I was paying like five hundred dollars a month on a prime spot. Wow! Just because of a food truck. What what, what was the truck scene like then? Because I, I actually talked to Michael Ripka of Torchies for yeah. this as well, and I remember you know that's how they kind of got their start right. here in Austin too, and. That was 2006, I believe, but yeah. he was like ghost town as far as trucks. Like right. you didn't have trucks at that time. Was it still yeah. the case in 2010? Yeah. So funny story. Uh, I don't think it was Mike that I met. Uh, it was the other partner. Um, so I, I remember going to their trailer park mm-hmm. on South First. They were so busy. Mm. But I, that's also that's when I kind of knew, okay, this Austin is a market. It's the place to be. Right. Uh, they're so busy. So I remember uh, meeting one of the owners. I don't think the that owner's there anymore. I asked him, hey, can I park my truck next to yours? <laughs> Obviously <laughs> not. But uh, they are truly an inspiration yeah. uh, for me to believe that, oh, like if they can do it, I can do this here too. Yeah. Uh, the food was great. So they brought um, the level of co- competitiveness to the marketplace in what we were doing. So I knew that I needed to keep up in order for me to be successful too. Right. So you mentioned South by Southwest and uh, I know that South by brings like a hundred thousand people to town or something. People, yeah. It's, it's bonkers. And a couple of times yeah. I've been here for South by right. Austin is just a different city. So that must have just been a, a launch pad for you. I mean, you might, did you have lines like crazy at that time? Yeah. So that time frame was really cool too. Like 2010, 11, 12. I think that's when like Foursquare was really popular. Oh, sure. Uh, Twitter was like getting a ton of traffic. Uh, and the Square, the reader, mm-hmm. was like in a beta system. Mm. So like the time-wise, people were all tweeting and they're checking in on Foursquare. And we're using this like really cool stuff on our iPad, like credit card mm-hmm. swiping. So if people are like wanting to like just check us out and they're on the street anyways. And we're open yeah. till like four AM. So they can go party. That's right. And South by is like ground zero for all of that innovation. So right. everybody at South by knows this stuff, That's right? That's right. Yeah. And they're like just it was quite an experience mm-hmm. because the street marketing was really big then i think it's got, got gotten more mature but everything was just on a street level at that time so i remember just having bands like playing in front of our food truck mm. which attracted crowd and just people tweeting people checking in so it was really fun experience yeah. and i think that's when we uh, took advantage of just the whole scene and yeah. we were getting written up so much because everyone's here mm-hmm. yeah right all the tech companies <laughs> yeah. yeah that's right yeah. like uh, publishing companies are right. here so like where to eat like where's the top places to eat and that's when we were just getting a lot of uh um you know, free press, which is great. And now, I mean, just at South by earlier this year, you guys have like the prime corner yeah. at South by Southwest. Yeah. Like one of the entrances to the convention center, you're just set up right there. Do you, yes. Did you enter into like a partnership with South by Southwest or how does that work? Yeah. So uh, we have a uh, agreement with Austin Convention Center. So, you know, that's part of our deal is that uh, we uh, showcase uh, what Austin's all about. So mm-hmm. we're part of Austin, but we also do profit sharing. So that's also good for uh, the city, the convention center, uh, Levy, who we, we partner with, and us. Yeah. Yeah. So going back to then 2010, you're, you're, you're setting this brand up. You have this great explosion in, around in March, around South by Southwest. Yeah. How then were you also sort of setting the brand up in terms of branding and, and, and building it into something more? Because I know, too, at the time, Roy Choi was taking off. Yes. That was when sort of the, this idea of Korean barbecue plus food truck was becoming right. kind of a, a known thing. Yes. Were you trying to similarly set it up in that fashion or did you have grander plans for Chilantro at the time? Uh, for me, it was just about survival. Mm. Yeah. Like there were Roy Choi in L.A. and there were other food trucks there was a, I think, at some point, food truck movement, uh, and I definitely was in the right place, right time, uh, to just be in the scene. While I don't know, probably ninety percent of the time, what I'm not don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> uh, just still in that survival mode, yeah. just grinding every single day to survive, and 
really like just there's just no time to look up mm -hmm. like i just need to cook serve our customers clean the truck you know tweet and do that every single day and make sure that our customers are getting provided with you know the best that i can offer right uh so that was just my my um my goal at that time um but yeah and then after south by southwest was there a drop off or do you feel like that put that put you up on that pedestal that remained yeah i mean there's definitely some energy that that were carried on we were definitely everywhere put in terms of just the me social media mm -hmm. so the locals who stayed away from south by started coming and checking us out at our food truck and our our spot uh the late night spot became the place to go to mm -hmm. so after a night of drinking like our spot became uh oh like where do you go after the bar closes like you go to cilantro for it right right and uh so we heavily relied on our late night business mm -hmm. and that's when where i created the original kimchi fries yeah too. let's hear about that because i know the kimchi fries are like your guys's bread and butter i mean this is your signature product how did yes. that how did that come to be so uh when we went to night location which was at fifth in colorado in downtown I, we we look like just like any other taco truck mm -hmm. and people didn't understand the concept of Korean Mexican fusion. Um, so, uh, you know, people are drinking, people are coming and they're asking for carne asada taco or <laughs> al pastor taco or burrito. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's just how it was. <laughs> like they didn't know who we were. Right. Right. Oh, there's just a food truck there. Like, yeah. That's must be a, Mexican taco truck. And, and there's a, a pretty great taco culture in Austin. So people, Absolutely. So people are really educated on tacos. Yeah. Right. So for us, it's like, wow. Like for me, like I can't, look, I thought about, oh, should we like add, you know, maybe pastor or asada? Like at one point, because people are asking for it, you mm. give what people want. Right. But I really needed to stick with like what my, my brand was, which mm. is a Korean barbecue inspired. And, uh, Every time, you know, people are asking me carne asada, I would recommend like, oh, like Korean barbecue beef. Mm, okay, that's what mm -hmm. we're going to serve. If they're asking for al pastor, I'm like, oh, like spicy pork, Korean barbecue spicy pork. That's what I would offer. Uh, so taco, burritos, you know, it's going well. But I always felt like I can't, like I, we have to have our own identity mm -hmm. as Chilantra. What are we known for? And, you know, even that time, like we weren't selling kimchi. Kimchi wasn't that hot. Mm. People are asking, people were asking, like, what is that? Oh, like, mm -hmm. it's fermented cabbage. Like, even the word choice that, choices that we were using weren't, like, that friendly. It's to not very a sexy. Lot of, yeah, 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 <laughs> right? Uh, so, we were like, oh, like, pickled, spicy pickled cabbage. It's Korean style. Mm. Or like it's, it's So, I had ton left over. And as it gets more fermented, I love, the fer I love our fermented kimchi. But I just had the idea that it would be less intimidating if it was fresh. Mm. So if it was old, like I couldn't do anything with it. I was throwing away and it was wasting food. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't do that anymore. Yeah. Like I felt guilty. So I, one night I just, the, whole, the thing was when we were busy, I told Julia and my other cooks, my, my staff, like just put something on the grill. So the smell goes out. Like, just put anything. Like, just put meat on it. Like, I, I don't care. Preferably kick. food, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, put put grilled veggies yeah. on it. Just put anything on it where it smells good so we can attract people. Great idea. Uh, so I caramelized the kimchi. Hmm. And there's, there's, there are two things that we weren't selling well were fries and kimchi. Because people just think we're taco and burrito and quesadilla place. Right. So I put one night, I put everything together on, on the bed of fries. I put caramelized kimchi, Korean barbecue, cilantro onion, which we still have it on the truck, mm -hmm. um, and sauces, sesame seeds on top, 
and I would serve it to the most drunk person that didn't know what what they wanted to get. <laughs> so the, I don't know what should I get. It's like kimchi fries, and they're gonna have. And the there was the most expensive <laughs> item too. Yeah, it looks it, it's 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 big. It's on a two hundred boat, but we pile on, pile yeah. it on top, and it's saucy. It's cheesy, uh, and it became it became our our, our or just number one item. Why did you have fries before? Did you just feel like that you have to have that kind of American side to go along with it? No, a food truck came with a fryer. <laughs> <laughs> so you're like, well, I might as well. I might as well serve fries. <laughs> well, that was a, a good sign for you. Right? It worked out okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it did. <laughs> so then did, did things go gangbusters? I mean, what, what, how does that then set you up for success? Did people keep coming back for the fries? Yeah. People were coming back for the fries. People were talking about it, and the the the, the social influencers that that we know of, right today, especially in Austin, I think that we were getting a lot of support. People were just getting started on social media, mm-hmm. and they were writing blogs. So you know, we just couldn't have money to advertise, and they were the source of our advertisement. Yeah, like they would talk about us, they would rate us. The Yelp was. Um, becoming really popular Mm -hmm. and I would lose sleep over a three-star review Mm. I mean it was so stressful for me Uh. if I had two or one I was like oh my gosh like uh, I need to keep up I need to do better Mm. and I would get upset at myself and the team whenever we had bad reviews and you know it's biased right like it's it's personal opinion Mm -hmm. yet I think that at that time I don't do this anymore but at that time uh um, that was gaugement of how our brand was doing. Mm. Today, we use it as a resource to uh, an opportunity to make ourselves better. Mm-hmm. But um, you know, then I was like, we shouldn't do that. Or you know, it was very. I was very critical. You can't take it too seriously now. That's right. Most people don't post good reviews. They mostly turn to a, uh, a reviewing a restaurant if they had a bad experience, right? If you had a good experience, you're like, okay, they did their job. Yes. But if they did a bad experience, yeah. somebody must know. That's right. So, especially the written reviews, because right. I think you, if you do stars, it's easy enough to do, but the written yeah. reviews, that's when you're airing out yeah. the laundry. But they're also important. Yeah. Like, I'm not there, I'm not at our stores all the time, so it's such a great indicator for us to gauge you know make improvements based on customers review yeah and we got to take it with a grain of salt yeah yeah so then growth you you open multiple trucks right at this point did you decide that the growth of vehicle no pun intended for you was going to be food trucks i thought it was going to be um but i've always there was one point where i had a dream of okay i think we can go into a restaurant and that was always been the goal Mm. after that but uh the food truck uh was was an easier way to expand uh instead of investing in a restaurant you know two hundred thousand dollars to half million dollars for for our brand with food truck we're you know we're leasing it uh we can get we can take the the food truck out on the road the next day we just need to wrap the truck so at one point we have five food trucks mm. and um we thought we were going to grow a food truck route we thought about franchising food trucks so we went out to houston to see if we could operate the food truck concept we were successful but it was definitely challenging yeah well that's couple hours from here right so that's probably stretching you did you feel like you had to go down there to oversee that yeah uh, for me uh, it was very stressful. Uh, I remember driving uh, to you. It's it's a, it's about three hours away, mm-hmm. and I remember going there, driving there, and you know, getting a few spinning tickets along the way. Right? <laughs> Wait, in the food truck? No, oh. just like my <laughs> well, food trucks were there in I was Houston. Say, can so you imagine? I was just commuting back and forth <laughs> okay. a lot. Yeah, and. You know, now I think about it, yeah, I wouldn't do that again. But there was an experience of what not to do yeah. if we're going to a different city without mm-hmm. having the right infrastructure and system and uh, people in place. And I, I'm, I'm no real expert on this, but Houston strikes me as... Um significantly different vibe as than Austin. Yeah. Um, maybe just doing business there, especially if you're seen as an outsider. Is that is that a harder 
thing to tackle when, you know, it's kind of like these cities like Chicago and Philly. I think they're really sort of fiercely committed to their independent local brands. Yeah. Did you find the resistance to like this Austin guys trying to come in here and do this thing? It's definitely intimidating for sure. Mm -hmm. So you, we built, uh, I think it was helpful that people who graduated from UT oh, yeah. uh, went back home and that was kind of our core customer base. They, they knew about us. Uh, and it's there's something about Austin brands going out to different larger cities mm -hmm. and they're getting, uh, you know, uh, good, good reviews and good reputation. But it's definitely intimidating. Um, so we were, we just worked hard. We we focused on what we needed to focus on. Our our core, you know, focus has always been the same, like great customer service, great food, and just provide a clean environment. So instead of feeling competitive uh, with our, you know, their different brands, we were just saying, let's just focus on what we know best mm -hmm. and gain customers' trust. Because mm -hmm. if they like it, they'll come back. Yeah, it's a great point. Yeah. Then what takes you to brick and mortar? At what point do you decide that maybe the truck is not the route for your for, for growth, but you do want to go into the, the brick and mortar restaurant? Yeah, so my first brick and mortar store was in 2014. Okay. Um, I was raising funds. I was raising money for a restaurant space. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I was raising about half a million dollars. I had this like projection of uh, what it should look like. And I've looked back recently, and I can say that we're a little off, but then at the same time, invest, investors should have taken the, the uh, <laughs> taken that opportunity because right. yeah. I was like selling the whole Chilancho brand. That was the only way I could make this work. Wow, yeah. So I was putting like the food truck business, restaurant business, like Chilancho brand. Like they could have invested two hundred thousand dollars, and we would they would be worth a lot more now. Right. But I was just raising money to 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 go into a brick and mortar. Yeah. And during that process, I was also going to banks too. I was just wondering. I was just exploring different options. Like, okay, investors, but can I borrow money from the bank? Mm. I've, I've had experience, uh, just getting some term loans. Uh, so I was curious about SBA loans. Mm -hmm. um, and there was, so I must have gone to about 15, about 20 banks. You know, they all, all, always immediately say no. Yeah, I don't think I had the books right together either. So it took a lot of time to, 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 to prepare um, the books. Mm -hmm. But there was one bank that, that said, all right, we'll give you the money. Wow. Yeah. That's bold because restaurants are sort of famously bad risk. I mean, that's right. So that's why you got a lot of no's before you get that one. What was it that they saw in the Chilantro business? Well, it was a second generation restaurant space. Okay. And that's, I mean, I love second generation restaurant space. So it's space. fit out already for your needs. Yes. Yeah. Um, it was a 1500 square foot space, uh, Chinese restaurant, you know, kind of going under. So. But it was a new restaurant, so I made the the owners the, the offer to buy, and we had the number, and I went to the bank and say said, you know, I, I'd like to take the space. Mm -hmm. So they collateralized everything that was in the restaurant, and you know, I was the guarantor of the whole thing, um, and then I, I, I've been saving at this point, you know, from food truck you know i'm still living you know frugal uh one bedroom apartment uh, you know l low rent like just everything about my lifestyle was cheap everything you're doing is going back yeah, into I'm just, yeah and yeah. i'm like just waiting for that day where okay like i need to make up for something then here i would have cash so yeah. i don't have to worry about it um so i took everything you know, was in the savings that I've been saving up. And I was like, okay, this is the, the big, big chance. So took out the loans and then took out the cash and went into a restaurant. That's scary. Oh, it was so scary. <laughs> I can imagine. Oh, it was so scary. Especially because you've been doing trucks now for four years. Yes. 
you're probably pretty accustomed now to that truck life. Yeah. Was it also sort of reminding you of your days in the coffee shop, like having that physical space? That, oh, of course. That Everything <laughs> comes back. Yeah. Like the, what all the scenarios of like how I can fail uh. comes back. <laughs> <laughs> like you say you open the door and then nobody shows up. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah, like with the food trucks, the interesting thing about food truck business mm -hmm. is that we pick the time to be at a certain site and we open up. Right. And it just happens to be that if it's lunchtime, we'll open up at 1130 mm -hmm. and we'll close at two. Yeah. So that time frame. But restaurant, like we open at 1030, like nine o'clock sometimes. Yeah. And then it's, it's like crickets. Yeah. Until like you get to lunchtime. So it was that. Like yeah. When we opened, we opened for breakfast for some reason. I don't know why I wanted to do breakfast, but <laughs> so we opened up for breakfast and no one would show up. Mm -hmm. And we thought, well, Starbucks is next door. I'm thinking coffee, right? Okay, coffee, donuts. We would serve breakfast tacos, so it's a good fit. You so, watch Starbucks way too much to I, base your too business much. decisions. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we opened for breakfast, and, but we weren't successful. Yeah. <laughs> Go but we were just working so, so hard. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, you know, on hindsight, if we had the resources and, and people to operate well, like now, you know, we have experience and knowledge to, to understand how we should operate the business. But yeah, it was really challenging. Yeah. So we were there just almost 20 hour days and it was mm. a lot of, you know, sometimes arguments and I'm friction. Sure. Uh, yeah, we had to go through all that. It feels like with the truck industry back then, part of the success of it was the fun of it. It was the finding it and, you know, s sitting outside and being a part of sort of this culture of trucks. And then when you open a brick and mortar, you take all of those fun things away. Now, of course, there's way more also risk and sort of downsides to running a truck that you get upside with a, a brick and mortar. But yeah. did you feel like you lost some of that sort of the funness of the truck or were you, did you also try to maybe translate some of that truck energy into the brick and mortar space? Um, I, I'm, I'm a very competitive person. So I didn't think about even on the food truck, uh, like we wanted to serve our best. Mm -hmm. Um, so that competitiveness going into a restaurant, uh, like I wanted to win. I wanted to get people's hearts. Like I wanted our customers to understand like what we were doing. Mm -hmm. And also like there's a certain sense of a val validation. And I, I'm sure that a lot of food truck owners can empathize with me on this. <laughs> I have a huge respect for a food truck and trailer entrepreneurs. But I felt like when I was, it didn't matter if I had three food trucks or five food trucks, I would not, I don't think that there were restaurant owners that was giving me respect. Oh, yeah. And I think that was important for me. Like our community giving us the respect was important for me. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, I just wanted to prove everybody wrong yeah oh uh, but you know <laughs> <laughs> well now you have <laughs> uh, well right? uh, we're getting there you know yeah. uh, but definitely food truck was definitely fun we knew our game if one place didn't work we would just pick up and leave that yeah. was great thing about food truck right you can play your Rest odds yeah restaurant we're all of a sudden we're paying six thousand dollars in rent we're stuck in one place yeah and customers have to come to us mm -hmm. so that was a scary part is that would they come? And luckily, they started coming. Yeah. Uh, so which was great. But um, had you built a list or like social media? What was the what was the following that you had built that you got them to come? Yeah, it was all mm. the community of people that were were supporting us from the food truck days. Mm -hmm. Like I, I get emotional like thinking about the moments. But yeah, I would see the first Yelp reviewers of our business coming to our uh, Kimberly and Michelle. I still remember their names. Uh, <laughs> Shout they, out to Kimberly and Michelle out there. <laughs> they uh, were the first ones to write the Yelp review. I never forget. So I look mm. at their faces and I remember them. And they were the, also the first ones to come to our restaurant. Mm. Uh, so it was so special. Yeah. Uh, five star reviews I hope uh, yeah okay <laughs> <That's good. laughs> Kimberly and her one star review <laughs> but, like so 
community of the people that were were fans of ours, they they came to us. Mm-hmm. They were coming from uh, like twenty minutes away to people that were like in Houston or Dallas that they moved away. Mm-hmm. Like if they were in Austin for a weekend, like they would come and say, "Hey, it's like congratulations!" Cool. So yeah. it was awesome. Yeah. Yeah. What kind of a location was it? Was it because it wasn't downtown, right? So this was no. outside of town a little bit. Was it a neighborhood? What what kind of location? Uh, still central. Okay. Uh, it was a south of south of downtown. Mm. Uh, just it's on Lamar Street. Uh, ton of great restaurants. Uh, Uchi's on Lamar. Oh sure. Uh, so and, and Odd Duck is on Lamar. Mm-hmm. So it's we just got great group of restaurants on that road. Yeah. Uh, but luckily. It was just we were just the mid uh, built just the mid uh, cap uh, in a shopping center. Okay, because I know that that then also changes to some degree the demographic of people coming in your restaurant. Yeah. So food trucks were pretty niche. I mean, this is something that you know probably especially younger folks were doing that, and you know some people just didn't you know they're not considering the food trucks when they want to go out for dinner. So now you become accessible to that type of audience as well. Did you right. find that that was the case that yeah. you were just like expanding the variety of people who are coming in your doors? That's right. Uh, the downside about food trucks are, uh, you know, it's not weather resistant, right? If it's extremely hot in Texas, like nobody's coming out, which is a fair amount of the year. right? <laughs> and if it's extremely cold or if mm-hmm. it's raining, I mean, forget about making money. Right. Uh, all of a sudden we're in an AC unit that changes lives mm-hmm. yeah that's right us. you especially <laughs> yeah uh and people and they got, we got some seating so people were sitting down and eating and mm. that was a new experience for us but it was great to see yeah did you change the menu or anything about the offering at all when you went in brick and mortar yeah so okay. uh i started you know it was all about the late if it was all about the late night food focused when i was running you know late nights uh, when I went to restaurants, I knew that we needed to become uh, more a daily uh, cuisine, mm. meaning I want people to come like twice a week right. and, and feel good about eating at our place. So I, we introduced rice bowls, salad bowls. Uh, so the bowls w- were were being introduced. And my, my vision with that was if I could eat at my place two, three times a week, uh, I think it'll take some time, but I think people realize that we're just not late night food concept. Sure, sure. Was that a strain on the business, being able to expand the menu and things like that? I mean, was it a learning curve for you to understand how to do that? Yeah, it was a learning curve for, for sure. Uh, I think, uh, you know, it's it was it's a risk. Yeah. You know, when, when we're introducing something and trying to change the branding a little bit, I mean, improvise the branding to, to connect with people that, uh, you know, if there's like a yoga studio across the street. Like, do we want that customer? Yes. Yeah. So we have to introduce something that they like, but still stay within our concept, right? our, our, our brand, so then it doesn't dilute. Uh, the, the feel of cilantro and that was pretty challenging but right. we, we started doing that so i think the first time that i ever learned about cilantro and and you was on shark tank yeah probably for a lot of people out there that was the first time you right. got this national exposure yes was this about that time because this was a 2015 2016 i think you went on shark tank is that sound right yeah okay. so 2016 was when i went on shark tank why did you want to go do that so I had a little taste of um, going on, uh, uh, being featured on Food and Wine. Okay. And that was like dream come true. It's like a drug getting to have that. Yeah. Yeah. Like you, 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 every, I think everyone in the food world probably dreams about it. Sure. And you know, right after QSR, but yeah, no, no. I, totally. I agree. QSR. <laughs> And then way on the uh, b- bill bottom. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Pretty wine. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Pretty wine. <laughs> uh, and, and I've been featured there and I felt like, oh, like I'm not a chef. Like I started to begin to realize I'm an entrepreneur mm. in, in the food business. And I love like fast casual, like because that's what I liked. Right. Like I would frequent fast casual restaurants 
then get excited about going into a fine dining restaurant. Yeah. Uh, and then, like, I find myself sometimes um, complaining about fine dining restaurants uh, where it's too expensive and I feel like I didn't get what I paid for, where I would go to fast casual restaurants or local spots that that's extremely cheap but i get there and i get full and it was amazing the great story behind the brand uh and i kind of knew that that was that was my thing uh and i dreamed of what if i were to be on a show what would what would it be and Hmm. it was shark tank so you just went for it well, I applied three times. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I remember that. Actually, yeah. in your segment, you said, because yeah. you come out, you go, yeah, you're like so thankful to be on the show, right? right. Because it took a lot, of, a lot of effort. Was there a fear, though, that, so I don't know a whole lot about Shark Tank. I like watching it. But um, to me, in my head, I think this is a very high profile way to give up a big chunk of your company. True. Did that scare you did that go through your head thinking about like oh like this is real like these are real people with real money and but it's also tv so there's also the element of entertainment that they want this to be entertaining and interesting yeah so i don't know i guess to me when you're going out for that sort of big investment part of me wouldn't want to go on national tv to do it but what what was going through your head um to me it was about the story Mm. Um, the, I wanted to, again, just validate what I was doing. Uh, I was introducing, uh, Korean barbecue in a fast, casual way. And there are a lot of brands, a lot of ethnic cuisines as well. That's doing, you know, are nationally known. And I I know that Korean barbecue wasn't, uh, and I wanted to introduce it. I just felt right. Mm -hmm. Like I wanted to. Like, I just thought it'd be really cool if I'd be on the show. So I started <laughs> applying in 2014. Okay. Didn't get it, but built a relationship with producers. Mm. 15, um, you know, I know actually I started like 13 because that, that before I had the restaurant. Okay. And then after that, built, and then during this time, had built relationships and producer somehow like saw that we opened up a brick and mortar. Okay. So, it just told a great story. Yeah, changed the story a little changed, bit for it. Yeah. yeah. Like, I was, like, saying what I wrote down on the application. Like, right. we'll have, we're a food fleet of food trucks. We will have restaurant with the investment. Like, that story kind of matched up. Right, right. And then when I got on, uh, yeah, it's it's intimidating. But, again, it's, like, once in a lifetime. Sure. And I love those moments where uh, it's a once in a lifetime opportunity and, for me, I knew that there are things that I can't control, mm-hmm. right? Things like who's going to invest. Like, I don't know who's going to invest. Would they like me or not? I don't know that. Uh, but what I could control was I know what I know from the experience that I had of running Cilantro mm-hmm. and building Cilantro. And I'll just be by my, I just be me and sure. see where it goes. So. We'll, we'll get into the, the fact that you did get a commitment to an investment from Barbara Corcoran. Yeah. Um, but before we get into that, do you feel like that uh, that appearance on Shark Tank elevated you? I mean, did you get a significant response from customers? Yeah. Okay. We saw a huge uh, surge of uh, increase in, in our sales and the customer base. Mm. Uh, when I first started Food Truck... Late nights. Mm-hmm. So we're, we're attracting 21 to possibly, I don't know, you know, like, <laughs> you, know, yeah. you, know, you know, like who wants to stay till like whoever wants to stay <laughs> right. till 3 a.m. Yeah. and eat late, late night food to going into restaurant, just, you know, attracting the locals there. Mm-hmm. And after we ap- appeared on Shark Tank, we, w- we, we were attracting a lot of families, mm. even like a lot of retirees that would come in and say, Ah, like I've been to Korea, Korean War, like Korean War, like so. You wow. know, you're just getting different people, yeah, that were never exposed to Korean cuisine, or they're familiar, but yet they don't know what I was doing. Yeah, and they started coming in. So on the show, Barbara Corcoran commits. Uh, I, I want to say it was six hundred thousand yeah. dollars for like a thirteen percent stake, or I don't know, it's twenty percent. Twenty percent. Okay. Yeah. Um, 
So then you guys enter negotiations off camera. So yes. then that's how that works, I guess. You guys then get with their people and actually yes. figure out the details of this. Now, it, it ended up falling through. Yes. Tell me about all of that, why that deal fell apart, and, and, and what you've learned through that whole yeah. process. Well, first of all, shout out to Barbara yeah. and her team, Michael. Uh, if you all get to listen to this, <laughs> uh, they were great to work with. Uh, just genuinely great people. Uh, just get, you know, they, they have just an energy there, certain energy that they bring on the table through, even during the negotiation where they really want the best for the partnership. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I really appreciated that. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, it was just my heart saying no. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, so it didn't work out. Was the was the business also getting to a point where it changed your mind about what you needed? Because you then you started to grow on your own. I mean, did you start to feel like maybe you didn't need that kind of investment at that time? Yeah, there was also a Shark Tank provided a great opportunity to for me to learn more about the fine financial world of restaurants. Mm. Uh, just opened my eyes completely on how much resources were available to grow a concept like cilantro. And that's when I elevated, I think, myself to learn about just who, who like who's out there, what company's out there, how mm. is this brand uh, uh, getting getting f uh, money to, to, to grow. Yeah. So once that world was open to me, uh, I was like thinking bigger. Okay. Yeah. So you, you are bigger now, you're at eight locations. Yeah. And now you're starting to think about franchising. Yes. What is what got you to the, to this point? Why do you think franchising is the right growth opportunity for you? And 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 get me to this point about what you've learned along the way since the appearance on Shark Tank and since the days you opened your first brick and mortar. Yeah, there is a for me, uh, there was a learning curve that I needed to have, mm. and it happens to be close to 10 years um, we're going on our 10th year uh in february mm. uh of 2020 so i started in february uh 2010 yeah going into our 10th year i think this 10th year uh during these 10 years i you know i look back and i i had so much things to learn and i was just premature i, I was seeing a lot of success in our industry as well as a lot of failures mm -hmm. uh in our industry a lot of concepts that raise a lot of money and they fail. And I really wanted to understand why they were failing. Yeah, yeah. It's same amount of capital, you know, same, just different brands raising maybe same amount of money. But uh, I wanted to understand uh, how not to fail. Don't make the same mistakes. Right. Yeah. Don't make the same <laughs> mistakes. And it, I needed a learning curve. Uh, so, uh, and... In terms of operations too, uh, our operation system wasn't tight enough where I felt like, you know, I can't give what I don't know to franchisees. Mm -hmm. Like I'm equally as is responsible for their success. Mm -hmm. um, so I wanted to make that right. And we are in a position to offer that. Uh, our brand's been around for 10 years. It shows tells you tells a lot of about like how we are, how we operate the business, and who mm -hmm. we are as as a company culture, and I think that people will buy into that. Yeah. So with that, you know, and also I, I'm talking with capital advisors and private equity because uh, now as, as we get bigger, I have a lot more responsibilities and getting the right people in the right position to support the business growth is important. Yeah. So that's why the capital comes into, into play for yeah. us. So that's where we are. Sure. Pretty interesting stage. And kind of makes you think maybe of, of when you open your first brick and mortar in that it's a little scary too, right? I mean, you're going into franchising is a lot about giving up some of your control right? and, and picking the right partner. You're, that's you're right. placing a lot more bets than you have been in the past. Right. So, does that scare you, energize you? I mean, what about that? Are you, what are, what are you thinking about this whole process? Yeah. Um, I think the immediate reaction since uh, I started the company, definitely there's a certain, 
it's it's a romantic mm -hmm. like i love to create great story mm. so the thinking about well these people i mean not these people meaning like some franchisees will just uh, want one capital gains through this opportunity um but at the same time i love the idea of sharing the vision together yeah. with people that truly mean uh mean it and want to grow it with me mm -hmm. uh and i see them as investors i see them as operators and the, the perspective is that i have you know general managers who i treat them like my partners today uh and their success is my success and my success is theirs mm -hmm. so that idea kind of trumps like the the fear sure sure you mentioned before how you really liked the fast casual industry and, and and you were you were following that industry interested in it yeah are there any brands out there that you feel like you're modeling cilantro after or anybody you really look up to and appreciate how they've gone about this process yeah that's a great question um i it's still you know there's a chipotle next door to us uh in downtown and also at one of our locations in central Austin by Mueller, um, there's still an inspiration. I see their brand and I see what they're doing. I see how they're connecting with people and they're huge inspiration. So they, they're the ones that motivate me because we're a smaller brand. Mm -hmm. Like we should be better. Mm. Like we should be, uh, you know, like we should be operating better in a in our environment. Yeah. So they're definitely a motivating factor for me. Uh, newer brands that are really kicking ass are, I think, Kava Grill. Mm -hmm. uh, they're doing great. They just came into Austin, and they I think they elevated our our you know city with uh, fast casual brand. Yeah. And I look at them, I'm like, they're so inspiring. They have a drive through at the one in Austin, right? Do they? Yeah. Well, mobile pickup. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. window. I think they do a great job. Yeah. Um, so it's, I think the more the better mm -hmm. right now in Austin. Mm -hmm. And it's, I like having strong players. A, a lot has changed since 2010. Um, sure. You know, we have the introduction of third party delivery, mobile ordering. Technology has is, is just, there's a whole generation of new technology out there since you first opened. Right. How has that changed the business? What are you learning from that? What are maybe some challenges yeah. that it even creates for you? Uh, I see myself as uh, our brand is not an early adopter for sure. Mm -hmm. We, we understand what's out there, but we're not the ones that are saying, Oh, that's new. We're going to jump on right away. Uh, I still believe in, the face-to-face -face interaction with our customers, and that's very important. That's majority of our customers today. Mm -hmm. So we really focus on that. Uh, we're probably majority uh, adopter when it comes to technology. So, you know, there's sense, some sense that I feel like, oh, we're a little behind, but it's just a matter of time. We can keep up, catch up. Yeah. And then playing the online, the third party delivery games. Um, so that's how I feel. But the ones that we have adopted were that I feel proud of our HR platform, mm. which I think it's so necessary today. Like I want people to have easy schedules, yeah. ab able to communicate uh, any resources that goes out. On a platform, I want them to have it right away. Yeah. So whatever the messages that I like to, to for, for our staff, the all staff throughout to know, like they're on, like they see it because it's I get to put it on there. Yeah. Uh, and just culture wise, I think that's really valuable. Um, so a training system uh, for us to able to check in with them on a month to month basis or quarterly basis. Uh, so that we can offer them a raise, things like that. It's just a great reminder tools for us to use. Yeah. Um, and just in terms of the finance, like we got on to platform right away because we wanted to make things more transparent for, for us. Mm -hmm. So, uh, those are some technology that we get onto it right away. But in terms of delivery platforms, 
I get I I say we're a little behind. Well, the back end is important too. <laughs> oh, absolutely. You got to firm up the important. back end yeah. so. cuz not everyone integrates with each other, right. so that's really challenging. Right, right. Um, so, yeah. So you've learned a lot clearly in this industry. You had your coffee shop fail, then you got in the truck business. It's evolved to what you have with Cilantro today. Yeah. If you were to look back to, you know, your your younger self and and seeing young entrepreneurs get into this industry today, what would be your 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 main piece of advice to them and, and, and based on what you've learned in this 10 years plus now that you've been in this industry? Yeah, uh, there are a few key things. First is uh, a dream, big. Uh, I mean, you have to. Uh, and second thing is grind every day. And there's no point of like looking up. You got to perfect like what you're doing today mm-hmm. and, and believe in it. Um, the third thing is, uh, continue to learn. Uh, I mean, even for me, I I feel like I have a ton of things to learn every day. Mm -hmm. Uh, and there's like no stopping, uh, in in learning in our industry and continue to grow and learn. Uh, and then I think I don't see any reason why you wouldn't be successful and customers, you know, they're, they're the most important piece of it all. <laughs> right. Yeah, without customers, no business. <laughs> yes. So I, I say put your put your ego aside. Yeah. You know, customers are who is paying our bills and they're the forefronters and staff. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, the core values in our business is so important for us. And and that's that's how we promote people. That's how, you know, we fire people. We give raises to people. And my job is to make sure that our culture is intact and it's it's evolving and growing. Yeah. And our staff just knows about that. So yeah. that's awesome. Jay, thank you for taking time today. I really Sam, appreciate thank it. Thank you. Appreciate yeah. this time. There you have it. That's my conversation with Chilantro founder and CEO, Jay Kim. As always, go to qsrmagazine.com for all the news and insights you need on the QSR and fast casual restaurant industries. Go to qsrmagazine.com slash podcast for the entire Fast Forward archive. Or, of course, subscribe on your app. You can access the archives on that app as well. And please leave your feedback rate the show, or email me, sam at qsrmagazine.com. I would love to hear your feedback. That's all for today. We'll talk to you again next time.